towards the history of photography. So next slide, please, Helen. So here we are, what I call a selfie of John Thompson. Obviously, he's instructing uh, his assistants to, to pose this shot. And this was in uh, Fujian in China. But as you can see here, he's fully fledged Victorian gentleman with his hat and his long coat. So it's just good to bear this image in mind of, of John Thompson. So next slide, please. So here we are, he was born in 1837 in Edinburgh. And this is two years before the birth of photography. Now, Thompson wasn't from a very wealthy family. And as a teenager, he was apprenticed to an optical and scientific instrument maker. Perhaps Helen, let's back, go back one so we can look at Thompson. Yeah, that's it. While I give you, tell him, tell you all a bit more about his childhood. So during this apprenticeship, he learned a great deal about camera, lenses, and especially the chemicals involved in photography. Now, he was a very hardworking young man, and after a full working day, he still took himself to night school, at that time, the Edinburgh School of Arts. And this department is now part of Harriet Watt University. The 19th century Edinburgh was a cultural, religious, legal, and scientific capital of great importance. And this gave young Thompson the sort of intellectual milieu where he really thrived. And with photographers such as Hill and Adamson, Edinburgh became a great artistic and scientific center of photographic innovation. Now, after eight years of apprenticeship for educated men of not huge means and without perhaps the right kind of social connections, going out to the colonies was a good option. So in 1862, Thompson sailed to join his brother in Singapore. Together, they set up a business making chronometers, but also the brothers uh, built up a photographic studio. And Thompson was, at this young age, already fascinated by travel. And from his base in Singapore, he was able to visit uh, Malaya and Sumatra. He also traveled through the Straits of Malacca. Malacca. And these early journeys, help him to acclimatize to the local conditions and, and really nurture his interest in Asian culture and its people. So Helen, next to, so the next one, the next one, please. So here we are in 1865, Thompson got this big break. So through the introduction of the British Council, Thompson received an invitation to photograph King Wonkut of Siam. So this is King Rama the Fourth. This is the real King and I King. He was born in 1804 and he spent 27 years in the monastery before ascending to the throne in 1850. And during his period of monkhood, he actually studied with missionaries and that's how he learned English. And under his reign, Siam became open to Western scientific ideas and technology. And actually, Peking Mongkut himself was personally very interested in the new techniques of photography. So here on the left, you will see King Mongkut in the field, French field marshal's outfit, presented to him by emissaries of the King Napoleon III. On the right, he's resplendent in his coronation robes. And I just want to point out on his head is the Mahakatin crown, which date back a hundred years to King Rama the first. And if you Google and look at the current King, Rama the 10th, during his coronation, he was wearing the same crown. Next, please. So I can't resist putting, you know, adding this to the slides. This is Prince Chulalongkorn, uh, at that time, still the young crown prince and later to become one of the very important kings of Thailand, a modernizer. Uh, but I just want to point out to you the little, um, the hair, the top knot on his head that shows that he 
hasn't gone through the transfer ceremony, which we'll see a bit later. And um, and so this is at the beginning of Thompson's uh, time at the, the court. So the next one, please. Next slide here. Again, this is one of my favorite photos and to point out later, it's one of his legacies. John Thompson really, at, again now, very, very young age still, early period of his photography, he was already trying new things, pioneering new ideas. And here is Mom Ratchachai, who's King Monkut's attendant and, and companion. And they went to the monastery uh, school together where he also learned English. And, and in fact, Mom Ratchachai was often asked to speak with foreign dignitaries and look after them as they were visiting the court. Um, because this is a very unusual and un-Victorian uh, pose, uh, very casual. And therefore you're able to see his beautiful shoes, which look very modern today. Um, next slide, please. So the next few are very important images in the exhibition because unlike other court photographers, and there were other visitors, also local Siamese photographers working at the time, uh, John Thompson really got on well with King Mongkut and he, therefore he was invited to stay for a few months. And that's why he was able to capture images of these exceptional festivals, which other people would, you know, people haven't seen. This first one is the pres presentation of the Lenten robes. Because during the summer rainy uh, season, the monks are confined uh, to the temples. Normally they'll be out, you know, asking for alms uh, every day. So they're confined during the, the rainy season. So they don't in case step on some insects or, you know, killing life. So they actually all remain in the temple during that period. But at the end of the monsoon, all Siamese, in fact, up to today, Thai families present uh, clean robes they donate to the monastery. But here we are with King Monkhut and the cast of hundreds in his full regalia arriving at the temple. Next one, please. So this is the tonsuret ceremony with the crown prince. As I pointed out earlier, um, his the, the ritual is the cutting off of the top knot. Um, so all children wear this top knot, the hair, on the vulnerable part of the head. But when they come of age, then there's this ritual ceremony of cutting off that top knot and they become an adult. But here we see uh, Prince Chulalongkorn being paraded ceremoniously and with his father looking very proud here. And then on the right, you see his, little, his younger siblings still with their little top knots looking on uh, curiously. So next, next slide, please. Here we are. So here's a very interesting one I wanted to point out is the crown prince and his brothers with some, you know, royal pages. And they're gathering in front of the throne hall in the grand palace at the background. But next slide, please. It's not very clear the next slide, but I've sort of zoomed in for you to see the detail of the little boy in the white sailor suit. So he is Louis Leon Owens, son of Anna, their governess. So next, and I found this uh, page, is the opening of her page, uh, where we now know the story of uh, King and I, the original Hollywood film, then the musical recently that's been um, touring the country. And you'll see the opening page of uh, Anna's book, the English governess at the court of Siam, and this was published in 1870. And you will see, actually, that's why I picked the, the previous photo to show you a very familiar, uh, this is an etching of John Thompson's photo 
But Thompson was not very happy because he she used a lot of his photos to illustrate her book, but she never acknowledged him nor his work. Next, please. Now, this is January 1866. So Thompson was so inspired by an account by this Frenchman Henri Moreau about the discovery of the amazing complex, which today we know as Angkor. So Thompson was able to convert to visit Cambodia because King Mongkut gave him a letter to present to the King of Cambodia, uh, which is sort of a, a vassal state. King of Siam was the more powerful one. And this opened doors, but of course, it's not like today you can drive there. Basically, he has to trek up the jungle, down the river, and then uh, over to Angkor uh, on these elephants. Um, but, you know, he nearly, he got very sick during this journey, but it was well worth it. And John Thompson will forever be remembered as the first person to have photographed Angkor. Okay, next. Just a couple of fun slides. Um, this is the main entrance to Angkor Wat. In fact, if you visit today, uh, this is the same route to go into the complex via this, uh, this bridge. And um, next, please, next slide. Here, just want to show you the faces, the, the intriguing, the faces of Bayon, which is in the, so Angkor is a huge complex with lots and lots of different temples. And the most famous being the previous shot of Angkor Wat, but this is Angkor Tom, and there are today um, 37 of these faces left. I think originally some have killed over, and there should have been, I think, 51 face towers. Um, so after this major expedition, John Thompson returns to Bangkok, presented one set of the photos to King Monkut, and then set sail returning to London later this year, the year of uh, 1866. Okay, next photo, please. Uh, next, yeah. So he returns to London and um, he really made use of his time in Siam and in Singapore. And he used this amazing collection of Angkor photographs to establish himself as an important travel writer and photographer. And therefore, as you can see, he was invited to become a fellow of these two really august societies, uh, the Royal Ethnological Society and the Royal Geographic Society. Next. So here's the cover of the original a copy of Antiquities of Cambodia. And then next, please, I want to show you. So this is the spread opening up to the same photo that I had shown you earlier of the bridge over to um, uh, Angkor Wat. Um, so to add weight to his resume, he gave many lectures both in London and then back home in Edinburgh. And at one of these lectures, he met his future wife, Isabel Petri. So Isabel was a daughter of a South Sea captain. And so she had given her family background, her, fascinating, her fascination with travel as well. Uh, she was game to join John Thompson for adventure back again to the Far East. And they sailed separately. She sailed directly to Hong Kong. John Thompson sailed via Singapore. They went back in 1867. And then they were married in Hong Kong because I've seen them get their marriage certificate uh, from the church in uh, Hong Kong. Next, please. Uh, sorry, yeah, next. Right. So those of you who know Hong Kong might recognize, uh, recognize this as Devo Road, where today the tram line runs from the right. So that's a tram line 
going to Causeway Bay. But this photo is really fascinating because then you immediately see the harbour. So when you visit this same spot in Hong Kong today, the harbour is many, many, many streets further down. So it just shows you how much of the Hong Kong land uh, was reclaimed. Um, so there's a huge program in the 20th century of reclaiming land um, as the city grew. So next, please. So within a very short time of his arrival, Tom, John Thompson was able to get a very important commission. This was to photograph the commemorative book for the visit of the Duke of Edinburgh, who was the younger son of Queen Victoria. So this was the first royal visit to the colony. And this really, this commission sealed his reputation in Hong Kong. So this is a photograph of a Lyndhurst Terrace all decked out in the fineries. You can see lanterns and banners welcoming the Duke. Next, please. So uh, I hope you'll find this photograph interesting. Um, this is on the left, a photograph of Pedder Street. And what I have done is I've gone to the same vantage point on the right with a Hong Kong photographer today. And we photograph exactly from the same spot. But what is really fun uh, about showing you this is that on the left, you see, do you see these under the trees, the sedan chairs? Um, whereas on the right, you'll see a row of red taxis. And it's just to show 150 years apart, this street is still a favorite spot for getting your taxi. Um, anyway, during his time, Don Thompson had a really flourishing uh, business with his studio. Uh, so as a new colony, a lot of uh, people who were sent out there uh, to work for the government or uh, in business, uh, merchants went out there. After their stint in China, they would usually commission a set of studio photographs uh, to take home with them to show their family at the time in the Far East. So Thompson really made good money. Now, the next set of uh, photographs that I want to show are his photographs of China, but those photographs are really, these ones are paid out of his own pocket and taken out of his own interest. And perhaps with some idea of a book in mind, given how successful the Angkor photographs were. And these were taken mainly between 1870 to 1872. And this is because um, in 1870, Isabel was pregnant with a second child and they decided it would be better for her to return to England where she would have more care and support from her family. So she went back to her home in the Isle of Man. Um, and so at that point, Don Thompson was able to focus entirely on this photographic journey um, and, and he funded the travels out of his own pocket. So I'm, I'm grouping these China photos by themes. And here we are with the landscapes. And this was taken up in Northern China. It's the Nankou Pass. It's just outside Beijing. And you can see beyond in the hazy, the first spur of the Great Wall. So this pass was very rocky and for centuries, you can imagine that's where the donkeys and the mules, uh, where the traders took goods out from the ports of Beijing um, out through to the Silk Road. And this was quite a dangerous bit of the pass, but you can see on the left and the right, these amazing temples perched on the hillside. Next, please. And this is a beautiful, one of my favorite, as you can see from my my chosen background. This is Southern China, uh, a really wonderful shot of the Bangbu Grove at the, at the far end, but 
taken from a high vantage point. So you, you imagine he had to lock his heavy camera, his glass negative uh, all the way up to a little hill in order to take uh, this photograph. This is um, on the banks of the North River. It's a tributary of the Pearl River. Uh, but again, you can see the background. John Thompson is experimenting with something I call photography as art, inspired by the paintings that he studied art history in his youth, because sometimes he um, blocked off the clouds. Whilst when he um, made the print, he would put cut out some paper, or sometimes you will see from the negative glass today, he painted it out so that you can actually see the hills and the mountains at the back, like almost like a Chinese painting. And the way the technique he used was he blotted out the clouds in the sky. Okay, next please. Yeah, next. Yes, this is a really, really stunning photo. You, this is the Jinshan Temple in the River Min in Fujian, Fuzhou province. And um, this is still there today. You can visit today and take your own John Thompson photograph. Uh, but this is the only temple in the province of Fujian that uh, sits surrounded by water. Uh, it's a really, really beautiful photograph. Again, it's John Thompson experimenting with photography as art rather than photography as just uh, taking a photo of, you know, the, the place or the people uh, and, and is adding that dimension of the artistic quality to it. Next, please. This one I wanted to show because this is the famous uh, Ming tomb in Beijing. Some of you may have visited or hope one day you will visit, but it looks nothing like this today. It's completely built up with tourist buses going backwards and forwards. And um, these are the um, pairs of animals carved from limestone that's guarding the um, tombs of the Ming emperors. Okay, next please. Here we have, uh, I've uh, picked a set of portraits and these are really important. Again, they are, Don Thompson is uh, probably better known in the photography world for taking beautiful portraits. Of course, as you can see, I love his landscapes and artistic work paintings as well, works photography as painting as well, but portraits are his most uh, painting uh, works of, of photography. So um, this is the famous Prince Kung, uh, his dates are 1833 to 1898. He's, he was a younger brother of the then Empress Yanfeng, and he became very famous during the Second Opium War when he was tasked by the government to meet with the Allied powers. These are the British, French, and Russian to negotiate the peace treaty. And Prince Gong signed the Convention of Peking in 1860. Next, please. So this is again a wonderful portrait. Again, breaking the mold. Here are three um, ministers from the foreign ministry. And it is really Thompson's skill in capturing them in such a relax. And they're just sitting there having a chat. But don't forget, this is really pioneering uh, kind of portraits, very, very different to the Victorian style, very stiff, stylized portraits of that time. Next, please. And here is a wonderful portrait of Hui Lin. He's the governor of Guangdong and Guangxi, and therefore he was the most powerful official of southern China. Um, then, but this photograph really, you can see such details and the clarity and you're given the large size, um, these photographs that we're able to make huge prints out of the glass negative, even today using your 
phone, digital phone, especially a handphone, once you've enlarged, it will be pixelated. So we still really admire um, the photography, the uh, Weckelodeon, and the techniques of that time that Thompson really mastered so that 150 years later, we, we're able to use that same glass negative and blow it up into huge life-size portraits. Uh, next, please. Here, the next grouping I have for you are street scenes. And today we consider Thompson to be the precursor of photojournalism. Of course, that concept didn't exist at that time. So next, please, is the next one is the fruit cellar in the Hutongs. These are the narrow lanes of, of Beijing today. So you can almost hear him calling out, selling his fruits. Next, please. The, this is a magic lantern, again, new thing that arrived to China at that time, where the man on the right would do a running commentary of the slide showing foreign countries and foreign scenes. Next, please. So we have in the next group, my favorite section on the women. And there are, it's really from seeing these few a few contact prints of these images of women that I fell in love with this collection at the end will come full circle and I explain uh, how this exhibition came to be. Um, so this is a, a courtyard with the women in the women's quarter, but interesting to show you the woman on the right is a Han lady with the bound feet. But you can see the middle lady, probably just underneath the banisters, she's not got um, uh, bound feet because she's a Manchu lady, because Manchu who were actually the, um, the Manchu dynasty, they tried to ban uh, bound feet, but they, they couldn't because it was so ingrained in the Chinese society by then. Next, please. So this is the ladies having lunch. Again, you can see a bit better now. Uh, the Han, the Manchu ladies, what they did was you can see on the left, the young girl, uh, she, she's not got bound feet, but they've created, they've designed these shoes with the heels, the platform in the middle, which apes the, follows the sway of the Chinese women, the Han women, as they walk with the bound feet, there's a sway to it. It's very sexy. So they've created these shoes, as you can see on the left. Next, please. Here, just to show these portraits, very great detail of the finery, the clothes, the embroidery, the jewelry. You can see the lady on the left is from the north. You can see from her hairstyle, and her outfit, her short jacket, and the lady on the right with the long jacket, she's from the south, from Canton. Next, please. Uh, this is again, just quickly to show you what a wonderful pose. This could be from a fashion magazine of today. Next, please. Yeah, just to wrap up uh, Thompson's time in, in China and also in Asia, people always ask me, uh, which is my favorite Thompson photographs. So aside from the wonderful Siam photos you see during um, at the exhibition today, I am showing you these two side by side. On the left, she's a teenage girl uh, bride uh, from the North of China. Uh, of course, she's from a very rich family. You can tell from her embroidered clothes and her beautiful uh, gear, so, so this is kind of a wedding outfit, but her eyes look very sad and apprehensive. And this is because her life will be very restricted in the courtyard, you know, the scenes I showed before, and that's her whole life. Whereas on the right, this is an, a boat lady, or we call a tanka lady, who just born on a boat, fishing all her life, but uh, very simple clothes, very poor, but if you look at her eyes, there's this real sense of 
freedom. She's her own person. And for Victorian photographer, a man to have achieved this depth of understanding sort of through these two portraits and through the eyes of these two women, and you get an insight into their inner lives. So I, I, that's why I feel one of the reasons, and I'll talk a bit more now about the legacy of John Thompson as a master photographer. Okay, next. So here I want to point out a few things I mentioned before. So a pioneer of social realism. He broke convention of the day, how he posed the portraits with the sitters. He experimented with photography as a work of art. And the next thing I'm going to mention further on is he trained a new generation of professional travel photographers. Okay, next. So he uh, sailed back in uh, 1872 to London. And um, so this photo is from 1877. Thompson worked with a very famous social activist of, his, of that time, Adolf Smith, together. So Adolf Smith wrote the text and photograph, and John Thompson took the photographs of um, a book containing 37 photographs of essays. It's called Street Life in London. And this is very famous and referred to very often with, uh, by, photo uh, by professional photographers and especially um, photography of East London. And this is a classic document of social realism. And um, focusing on East End uh, street life, and here, this is a photograph of a woman in Victorian times. She's known as a crawler, a C-R-A-W-L-E-R, -E crawler. And because of unfortunate circumstances or maybe an accident or health reasons, this left them uh, spiraling down. So they became penniless. Uh, and so her job is to earn a crust of living by looking after these uh, babies. Oh, she's waiting. Next, please. So again, uh, evoking the street scenes that I showed you earlier that he took in um, in China. Here on the left are some laborers in Covent Garden. On the right, again, some street sellers. Next, please. And this is uh, these are called nomad families. And they travel up and down the country uh, in these, uh, well, they live, so the whole family live uh, in these uh, uh, sort of little sort of cards, horse-drawn cards. And they go up and down the country. They do odd jobs and seasonal jobs, uh, like fruit picking and farm laborers. Next, please. So just to compare, uh, bringing back sort of the, the the experience that he had of his time in in Asia, um, that here on the left you have the uh, lady selling flowers in Covent Garden, and on the right are some ladies in Beijing buying hairpins, uh, you know, for hair decorations. Next, please. So again, on the left, these are uh, people selling ginger beer at uh, Clapham Common in London. And on the right, you see a Muslim uh, butcher uh, with his apprentice uh, in Beijing. So I think now would be, I'm trying to demonstrate um, this dual thread of Thompson's photographic subjects. On one hand, he photographed the rich and the famous in Mongkut, um, uh, Prince Kung, you know, ministers. And also in his studio photograph, he famous lots of rich uh, photographs of, of these famous rich people. But he never forgot his own childhood. And um, he 
never forgot that. And therefore, he always made a point to show the street people and the laborers, you know, with the same kind of dignity. They, they weren't made fun of and they were just there uh, with respect doing, doing a job. Uh, you know, and so he never forgot his humble beginnings in Edinburgh. Next, please. So here is 1881. John Thompson was appointed a royal photographer then. And he has a very beautiful, soft language photograph of Queen Victoria. Probably a bit different from the, the ones that we normally see. Next, please. Here's a photograph of Princess Alexandra of Edinburgh, uh, her father who was visiting uh, Hong Kong, um, and with her colleague. So again, dogs, you know, through the royal, uh, the court of Win Windsor. So everybody loved dogs even till today. And the next photograph, please. Here you see again the four children of the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh and in the garden having a picnic again with their dogs. Next, please. So in 1886, Thompson was appointed as an instructor of photography at the Royal Geographic Society. And this is very important because using his vast experience these years of traveling in Asia, he was able to distill all this knowledge and pass on all his experiences, his successes and his failures. And, and through his work as an instructor, this inspired a whole new generation of travel photographers. So this is a photograph of John Thompson at the age of 60. And on the right is actually his letter uh, to the Royal Geographic Society when he stepped down and he retired as an instructor in 1917. Now, this is again one of his very important legacy because um, prior to him being an instructor, uh, expeditions, you know, the Royal Geographic Society supported many expeditions to different continents and uh, they themselves, the explorers, will take their own photographs as amateur photographers. After John Thompson, after this period, as the appointed instructor, all expeditions since that time until today, they would all, these exp expeditions would always bring with them a professional photographer to document um, the expedition. So that, so Tom, John Thompson, it was the watershed point of putting on the map actually the importance of documenting and documenting it properly in a professional way, um, the idea of travel, exploration and expeditions. So really he broke the convention of the day, he tried new things, he contributed to the history of photography, and um, so I think in some, I think next, next slide, please. I just want to, yes, um, give you the backstory if you're interested in how these two exhibitions came to be in my involvement because I'm not a trained historian nor am I a photographer. So. The story starts um, when Thompson, so with this, this letter, Thompson retired back to Edinburgh and he was part-time in Edinburgh, part-time he was living in London. He had a house in Streatham in South London. And a lot of the story are chance meetings and a bit of serendipity. So in 1920, John Thompson happened to have visited an exhibition of photograph owned by this gentleman, uh, Sir Henry Welcome, an American billionaire pharmacist, collector, and philanthropist. And Welcome uh, was himself really interested in photography, but Thompson discovered that 
he actually did not own anything from China. He had no collection uh, of photographs of China. So um, you see him, uh, so after John Thompson's visit, you see on the right, this actual letter that Thompson wrote to Welcome, offering to sell his 600, nearly 700 glass negatives and travel notes. Uh, next, please. Uh, next, yeah, here are the three crates and you can still see them today at the Welcome Collection. These are the three original crates where John Thompson stored the glass negatives. And because Welcome was such a rich man, he was traveling around collecting things, looking, he said, okay, send me your negatives on spec just to see whether he wants to buy them. So Thompson sent them in early 1920, but 1921, in September, Thompson died of a heart attack while traveling on a tram going home to South London. And he was 84. Uh, but at that point, the photographs were not yet sold. But luckily, because of the exchange of letters, his heirs, his children, who really didn't want to carry on with uh, photography, sold them to welcome for really a paltry sum of 20 pounds. And even for 1922, that was a small sum of money for 10 years of work. Um, but because of this, also it was very sad for the Thompson uh, family, his children who are involved with me with this exhibition, but it's fantastic for us because only someone like Henry Welcome, who had the money and the know-how, could keep the glass negatives in such excellent condition so that we're able to have our exhibition today. And so we fast forward to 1980s. The young librarian, William Schutbach, joined with the Welcome Collection. And one of his first jobs he told me, was someone had left a note on top of one of these crates saying, oh, take a look, and if they're not of good quality, just throw them away. Because Welcome then built up over a million objects in his private collection. And in the 1980s, certainly people they really didn't care and didn't value old photographs as we do today. But William made a few contact prints and some years later when I was visiting the Welcome Collection, he showed them to me. I fell in love, especially with the, as I said, the, the women, the portraits of the women. And I only took a six month leave from my job when I was at that time working at, at um, Asia House to just present one exhibition. But a, de a decade later, as Helen said, my two exhibitions, Siam and China, are still touring around the world and it's gone to three, uh, to three continents. And next, the final, your next slide, please. And in 2021, it was the centenary of Thompson's death and Historic Environment Scotland, which is similar to in London, uh, uh, English Heritage does put up the blue tags where they're bronze like this in Scotland. And this is a commemoration plaque at John Thompson's childhood home. Uh, it's in the old town in Edinburgh. If ever you want to visit, you can find it. Um, and so that sort of brings to full circle the story of John Thompson, the Siam exhibition, his contribution to the history of photography. And the last slide is uh, just my website in case you need to follow uh, future exhibitions and to see what the current publications are um, on John Thompson. <laughs>